Listener-supported St. Gabriel Catholic Radio AM820 brings you Dominican Dimensions, a half hour of lively discussion about Catholic issues from a Dominican perspective, featuring the friars from St. Patrick Church in Columbus. And now, Dominican Dimensions. Welcome to the Dominican Dimensions, a half hour of lively discussion about Catholic issues from a Dominican perspective. My name is Father Stephen Alcott, and I'm a friar at St. Patrick Priory in Columbus. Today I'm joined in the studio by Father Stephen Dominic Hayes. Let's begin with a prayer. Hail Mary, full full of of grace, grace, the Lord Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Patrick, pray pray for for us. us. Today we're going to speak about the creation of the world as described in the very first verses of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be um, reviewing and commenting on a wonderful homily by then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who gave some homilies, which are really beautiful lectures, about how we can understand the creation um, of the world as it's described in the Bible. This first homily, which we're going to discuss today, is about the first days of creation. I'll just read for you here the passage that Cardinal Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict XVI, is commenting on. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and separated the waters, which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind upon the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. This is Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 19. And here we have a narrative that is very familiar. And and yet uh, Cardinal Ratzinger asked the question, It is beautiful and it is familiar, but is it true? Does it not seem very different from what we understand from science? How we understand that the world, the heavens, and the earth were not created in a matter of a few days, but rather eons. And he asked the question then, if if this doesn't seem true, then what does that say about the rest of of the Bible. If there are parts of the Bible that seem inaccurate, then how do we know which ones are accurate and which ones aren't? And that's something that many people wonder about, or many people are bothered by. The fact that the Bible doesn't seem to match up with some things that we understand through reason, and yet 
Um, it is the revelation of God. So Cardinal Ratzinger goes on to describe how the church, not only in recent times, but for centuries, has interpreted the scriptures. How the church looks at the Bible, not just as one passage all completely isolated by itself, but with several passages together. Isn't that right, Father Hayes? Well, I think, yeah. I mean, as I you're talking, I'm just thinking about how uh, strange is the world we live in. You know, this is a in some ways, the, the, the problem the Pope is, or the Cardinal Ratzinger is talking about, uh, the difference between science and the Scripture, is really a completely modern problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it, and it's compounded by uh, a Protestant view of the Scriptures as uh, inerrant on their face without the need for interpretation or... Uh, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you know, without a community interpretation, uh, that you can just open up a Bible, and there it is, there's the Word of God, God made it simple for you, you just have to read and believe, and this is where the problem is. I remember having a great science teacher in college who was an evangelical Christian, and uh, we, I rem- we, we sort of pressed him on this, he said, because he, and he said, well, he says, in my mind, he says, there is one kind of truth for science, and there's another kind of truth for Scripture, and I keep them apart. Mm. And for Catholics, this is absolutely antithetical to right. truth. When I was a t- college student, I thought that was a, a strange and bizarre position that I couldn't take, because if God is one, then truth is one. Right. And there has to be a connection between one and the other. But the, as I said, the idea that the, that the scriptures can be read without understanding the context in which they, they're in, without understanding not only, only their literal and literary senses, mm-hmm. but, you know, it, which, you know, it's, nobody's writing in, the, in Abraham's time, nobody's writing, you know, science textbooks. These are literatures that have developed in the past few hundred years that nobody is reading for most of the human race's existence. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to take the scriptures on their terms, you have to try to read them um, in the sense and as the kind of literature that they actually are, not as you wish they were. And both the the rationalist scientific party on one side and the fundamentalist uh, you know, uh, religious party on the others are both reading him wrong. Mm. Uh, the Holy Catholic Church, in her wisdom, has always seen this differently, and that, as the Pope, I think, is, goes on to say, you really cannot read the Scriptures without reading them as a whole, without reading them in the terms of the light of him who became man for our sake, and who is the end of the Scriptures' revelation, and is the uh, the one who directs our interpretation of the scriptures towards uh, the the ineffable Father, whom He manifests in the power of the Holy Spirit. Right. This is just one passage where Cardinal Ratzinger speaks about um, how we can look at Holy Scripture. He said. Uh, Genesis 1, which we have just heard, is not from its very beginning something that is closed in on itself. Indeed, Holy Scripture in its entirety was not written from beginning to end like a novel or a textbook. It is rather the echo of God's history with his people. It arose out of the struggles and the vagaries of this history, and all through it we catch a glimpse of the rises and falls, the sufferings and hopes, and the greatnesses and failures of this history. The Bible is us the story of God's struggle with human beings to make himself understandable to them over the course of time, but it is also the story of their struggle to seize hold of God over the course of time. Hence, the theme of creation is not set down once for all in one place. Rather, it accompanies Israel throughout its history. Indeed, the whole Old Testament is journeying with the word of God. Only in this process of journeying was the Bible's real way of declaring itself form, step by step. <clears throat> so in other words, we have to read, as he says later, um, we have to, in a sense, read the scriptures backward. As, as Catholics and Christians, we start from Christ, and we, we recognize that in him all the words are fulfilled, and, and 
in him all of the other um, prophecies, all of the other ways that God has revealed himself before Christ came in the flesh. Um, in him, all of them take their meaning. And so Cardinal Ratzinger points out that as the, the beginning of the Gospel of John, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So scriptures need to be read um, in, in the context of the whole. You're listening to The Dominican Dimensions, a half hour of lively discussion about Catholic issues from a Dominican perspective. My name is Father Stephen Alcott, and I'm a friar at St. Patrick Priory in Columbus. Today I'm joined in the studio by Father Stephen Dominic Hayes. We've been discussing the very first verses of the book of Genesis and how we can read them as part of the whole scripture, how we can read them in the light of Christ. Now, this is one of two creation accounts in the book of Genesis, but it's even those are not the only two in the Bible, are they? No, there's, uh, you can look at three patterns of creation in the mm-hmm. scriptures. And uh, the third one is remarkably similar uh, to the kind of story that the Babylonians would, be of, would have been familiar with as a creation narrative. If you recall the, um, this, the narrative of the Babylonian creation, which the Jews in their exile would have been you know, familiar with as that became, was part of the liturgy of the Babylonian New Year. Right, and, and many scholars think that mm-hmm. the first Genesis creation account was actually probably came to its final form during the Babylonian exile. Right, the which people is Israel radically different. Are, are exiled in a foreign country and um, immersed in a culture that has its own account of creation. Right. The Babylonian creation has a contest between uh, gods and demons, you know, between uh, Marduk, the king of the gods, and uh, the, the, the city god of Babylon, not surprisingly, and the emblem of chaos, who is Tiamat, who is a female water serpent. Mm-hmm. Um, her, uh, her, the Marduk splits her in two and then shapes the universe from her, and human beings are formed from her blood. So this is sort of an interesting, you know, the point of the myth is not only to shape, you know, how did things begin, but also why are things the way they are now? Right. Why is it that people seem to be so ungovernable? Mm-hmm. Why are people ruled by their vices? Mm-hmm. Why is it when you stand there as, say, king in Babylon, that the people under you are so unruly and difficult and mm-hmm. have to be controlled by force, mm-hmm. you know, by the sword of the one who leads? And this is the life of paganism. This is the life of Babylon. And if, and if you understand that from the Babylonian perspective, they're, they're everywhere made from dragon's blood. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It kind of follows that we're going to be difficult to govern. Right. There would be, and the, the chaos of uh, that demon which out of which we were formed. Notice that the pagan creation is all full of deities, mm-hmm. that things are actually made from the bodies of gods. And how different is the narrative, therefore, of Ge- of Genesis chapter one, which is very simple, you know, mm-hmm. and there is no opposing power to God. Right, right. There is the, at the very beginning. It says the earth was void and empty. Right. But there was the deep, which is which is interesting because in Hebrew that's the word tahom. Mm-hmm. It's a particular. It's an the abyss with a capital A. Right. It's an emblem for. Uh, Chaos, disorder, and um, and and of course, if you put the female in, ending on that to make mm-hmm. it a a feminine noun, it ends up as Tiamat. <laughs> right. right. So, so, so Tiamat is there, but she's been she ceased to be depersonalized, and she's she ceased to be a threat. Right. And now God begins when we talk about the creation; He begins to arrange things in His creation without opposition. Right. You know, he's completely in control. He is not opposed. There's no one who can match him. And even things that were called by divine names like sun and moon in other cultures, he hangs as if lamps, you know. Right. And even and their names, of course, because those are names of pagan deities, are not mentioned in the text. It's actually a very subtle telling of who it is who is in conversation with his people, which mm-hmm. is what this is about, mm-hmm. not the shaping of the world, 
mm-hmm. so much, but right. it is about the the shaping of a relationship between God and the human race. In this chapter, he makes a stage for the great drama of his relationship with us mm. to play out. Right, yet yeah, as you were saying, Cardinal Ratzinger points out that um, for a Babylonian of that time reading this this text, they would think it would be sacrilegious because for the Babylonian person of that time, you know, the sun and the moon were deities, were gods. And mm-hmm. so to reduce them to simple light fixtures right. placed in, in the sky, you know, to give light. It seemed would irreverent. Be, yeah, so, so, but, so we see in, in the narrative that, that we have in Genesis, um, God is absolute. God is the one who's cre- mm-hmm. who creates. He doesn't create by overthrowing another god who is already there. Mm-hmm. He creates out of nothing. I should emphasize at this moment that when we talk about uh, putting this to paper in the time of the Babylonian exile, that the stories are are certainly much older. Oh, right, right. You know, these are not invented, but, right. you know, as – but under the shape of the Holy Spirit, the text as it's come to us is certainly made – takes its shape in tension with the specific historical and cultural influences that are going on at the time of, at the time of their composition. Mm-hmm. That doesn't limit us, however. As I said, there's three of these things. The second chapter tells a different narrative. Right. Where the first thing created is not light but Adam, Mm -hmm. and the last thing created is Eve. Right. And the whole creation comes into relationship with God under the plan of the relationship of these two human beings, the progenitors Mm -hmm. of the whole human race. Now, the third one is interesting because it's only fragmentary and partial. You find, Mm -hmm. and this does involve God in combat with a, a, uh, a watery serpent, okay, <laughs> who's often who's – often, sometimes we have Le- Leviathan mentioned, but a more common name is Rahab. Mm-hmm. Now, Rahab, the famous Rahab is the, uh, the, sp- the spy who uh, took care of Joshua's right. – you know, Joshua's – you know, the uh, woman who – a prostitute took care of Ra- Joshua's spies. But um, it also is a reference to this ancient serpent. Mm-hmm. Now, Rahab – this can mean uh, insolence, pride. Sometimes splendor is how it's mm-hmm. translated. It's sometimes referred to as an alternate name for Egypt, mm-hmm. that monster mm-hmm. of chaos, that monster that of the waters that is constantly mm-hmm. trying to destroy it. But but um, you, you find places where this is referenced in Psalm eighty nine verses five to twelve, Isaiah fifty one verses nine to ten, Job twenty six uh, verse twelve. Where this uh, this Rahab is a monster, a sea monster after the shape of Tiamat, mm-hmm. whom God destroys, who he mm-hmm. slays, who he cleaves in two. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and interestingly enough, some of this is also compared to the passage of the uh, – in the connection with the passage of the Red Sea waters and the freedom from Egypt mm-hmm. and the power of that uh, – Great crocodile of the Nile, if you will, mm. that great water serpent. Right, right. So, so it's not it, again. The question is, I think, what does this, what do these narratives tell us about the one who is speaking to us? Mm-hmm. You know, because and they have very specific meanings. I think so. When you get back, for instance, to um, the first chapter. Now, we didn't. You didn't include this in the narrative, but when we get to the sixth and seventh days. Right. There are some very interesting things going on, you know, the creation of the human race mm-hmm. and the beasts of sacrifice on the same day. Mm-hmm. But maybe uh, more import- more interestingly, the, the creation of the Sabbath, mm-hmm. uh, which is a day. It's an intervention by God in the life of the world, which is mm-hmm. how, you know, it's – day is not a 24-hour cycle because as been, you implicitly pointed out, uh, it's not till – uh, day four that we actually get a sun and a moon to mark right. days and nights before right. that. So what's marking it? Well, it's what's marking the day is the intervention and the action mm. of God. Right. So in the seventh day, it's interesting. His intervention is not to act but to rest, mm. which displays something about him, mm-hmm. that he as a God is not forced to create, mm-hmm. yet that this marks a freedom mm-hmm. that he has and 
that the image, those who made in the image and likeness of God, you know, male and female, he created them in the image of God, he created them, should also be be free. Mm-hmm. That it relay, that this long narrative reveals something both about what God intends us to be and our relationship before God, which has this freedom. We are not bound to graze seven days a week like the cow or, or hunt seven days a week like the wolf, mm. but that we have a life that transcends these things mm. as God himself does. Right. And so that points something not only about the identity of God, but our own identities. And I might suggest that this is, in f- fact, the direction of this whole first narrative mm. of the creation. So that it's our, it shows us our, our identity. It shows us it's God revealing himself to us as the one who is over all things, who creates absolutely, um, who doesn't even have to struggle against against another god to to you know or create or, or or pitch a battle in order to create things but who simply says the word and it is done and the culmination of this is is rest in which we share you know which implies mm-hmm. a relationship that we're made in his image that we can share in the in that life of rest with god you know in a way that the other mm-hmm. creatures can't and even the small details of the language of these things continue to reveal things. For instance, in the very first opening lines of Genesis, there is a speaker, there is a word coming forth from the speaker, there is the spirit hovering over the waters through whom this, the, the word passes to enlighten mm-hmm. the words, world and show the depths of that abyss mm-hmm. and the monster that's you know hiding there that uh, comes to bring light to darkness Mm -hmm. and to give us uh, a stage for which to live Mm -hmm. in his light. Right. You know, I I remember once, and of course, if Christians can see here both a hint of the Trinity Mm -hmm. and also the action of the the processions of – of the economic processions of the Trinity into history in the fa- in the Son and the Spirit to do the work of the Father, His two mm-hmm. arms, if you will, mm-hmm. lifting us into His life and heart. Mm-hmm. To be poetic about it, I remember once when I was celebrating Mass, I lifted the ch- I w- we said the words of consecration, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden I realized I was having a mini Genesis moment, you know, mm-hmm. because here was made playing the speaker of the word, the word that went forth to change and to take shape and Mm -hmm. form a new creation, Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity forming out of the little sea in the bottom of the chalice, you know, through the power Mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. And I remember being moved by all the depth and regularity, the patterns by which his love is known, has been known, and continues to be known to us Mm -hmm. in this one whom we engage, the living God whom we engage in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And that might be, for me, that's always been more important than simply the historical critical meaning of where these texts came from. Mm -hmm. For me, what is radically important is the is the moment of engagement with the living God that comes by my mind, you know, opening up to these sacred words, Mm -hmm. these blessed texts, this living word that comes to me, you know, in so many ways. You know, he who became flesh for my sake is also visible in these holy words and speaks to my heart as they become part of my own life and my own history. Mm-hmm. And my engagement with the Father who revealed, who sent him into the world. Wow, I never. It's beautiful about the the consecration of the chalice is the really a new, really a new creation. We have the mm-hmm. the speaker, the word being spoken, and the Spirit you right. know, who brings about the change. Um, so, these are the patterns of the God who lives beyond this universe, beyond creation. Mm-hmm. making his life and even his inner life known to us. Yeah. Car- Cardinal Ratzinger also points out that um, the, the, the church, um, as we were saying earlier, um, sees, sees all, of the, all of this creation culminating in Jesus Christ. Um, 
as, as, we, as we read in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything was made uh, that, that, was, that was made. That's the very first verse of John. And, and so just as God's chosen people um, throughout their history with all kinds of successes and failures um, uh, came to understand that even when they were exiled from their land, from their home, uh, they were not actually exiled from their God. You know, God was with them. God was greater even than the gods of, of, of the Babylonians. Um, and, and when Christ came, we realize that that God not only is is greater than all other gods, God comes to dwell among us. He comes into our world, comes into His own creation, so that we might be drawn into into His life. Um, if we see in in all of Scripture in the Old Testament, as Pope Benedict was saying, or Cardinal Ratzinger, that that struggle of God to make Himself understandable to us in Christ, um, we uh, begin to grasp God, you know, so that so that um, so that we 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 can grasp Him in an entirely new way, um, the way that that is not only in, in we, we see in the Scriptures, but also that that we live through through the sacraments, through sharing in that that seventh day, through the um, through through the through the Sabbath, which, which is also a symbol of eternity. Uh, and and so uh, in, in in closing, um, again we've been discussing uh, a homily of, of Cardinal Ratzinger. You can find it in a book called "In the Beginning: A Catholic Understanding of the Story of Creation and the Fall." Uh, and we've been reflecting on how um, the very first words of the Bible connect with the whole Bible and describe a relationship of God with His people, revealing Himself to us that we might share one day and his eternal rest and joy. Let's end now with prayer, invoking the intercession of our holy founder, St. Dominic. O light of the church, teacher of truth, rose of patience, ivory of chastity, freely you have poured forth the waters of wisdom, preacher of grace, unite us with the blessed. Amen.